Okay. Right. Uh, welcome once again. Um, why don't we just pray and get started, right? The tube light is seen, is it? Okay. You can bring it down a little bit. Okay, why don't we why don't we just pray, right? Father, we we thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us, Master. Yes, Lord, today is the day. This is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and we will be glad in it. Father, we thank you that in every day you are there, right from the beginning till the end. And Master, every moment, every hour, Lord, you are there, Lord. We thank you. And Lord, we pray that you will um, speak to us today, even as we look into your word. Lord, we pray that you will um, write your word upon our hearts, God, and um, enable us, even what we learn, Lord, we, that we will be able to put into practice daily in our lives. We thank you. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we've been, um, we've been learning about uh, principles, right? Um, when it comes to biblical stewardship, uh, we've been learning about the principles that um, uh, just a sec. yeah. So let me just share the screen. So we've been looking at some of the principles there that God has placed in His Word. He's put in His Word, um, and why is it there? It is there because God wants us to take it and apply it, right? Use it in our lives, right? And we are talking specifically about um, you know God's plan to prosper us. And we are talking about that. And uh, we see that God has placed these here because he wants us to, first of all, be aware of it, right? Because a lot of things don't happen because the church or the believers are not aware. You know, they are ignorant of some of these principles. So what happens when you are ignorant of some of these principles? You know, you might be very, very sincere. Right, we might be sincere in our hearts. We might be, uh, you know, full of faith and sincere. And well, God's grace covers our lives. That's for sure. Okay. But what happens is that we are not able to fully walk in what God has for us. Right? Fully walk in, fully receive, appropriate, be successful to the extent that God wants actually for us. Now, so God leads us to the truth because Holy Spirit is there dwelling within us. So he prompts, he speaks, he leads us to the truth, right? So our responsibility is not to be ignorant, but to have knowledge of the truth, right? But not just have knowledge of the truth and say, okay, you know, this is good, that is good. Appreciate the truth. But also to specifically walk in it. Right? Walk in it meaning Take the truth, apply it in our lives. Okay, not to be ignorant, but be aware of the truth. To apply the truth daily in our lives, right? And see the fruit or the end result of applying the truth of God's word, right? So that is why we have these principles. God has given us these principles. Now, almost on in anything, right? Any uh, subject matter that you can think of, God has given us these principles. So uh, we need to be aware of it and walk in it. Okay. So we looked at some. Principles last class. Okay, remember any of them? A lot happens in a week, I know. <laughs> so, anyone online folks can. What is it that you remember? Sorry? Releasing the. Ah, yeah. Work. When it comes to work, work needs to be diligent, and work is a way by which God prospers. Okay, very good. Any other? Putting God first, right? Um, and practicing righteousness, right? So putting God first, what does it mean? That means you give Him importance, right? You have Him as top priority in your life, right? So, and... Um, the verse, scripture verse that we can think of is, well, the Lord's teaching, he says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. So you know, seeking righteousness, doing righteousness, doing the right thing and having the right standing with God 
where God is saying, you know, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, right? He's talking about things like necessities, uh, everyday necessities, food, clothing, shelter, right? Will be added to you, okay? And he says all this in the context of worry, right? That Matthew chapter 6, it's all about worrying about the future and, you know, worrying about, about providing for our needs. And in that context, he says this, right? Anything else that we recall? You want? Sp speaking God's word. Yeah, speaking God's word in faith, declaring God's word in faith. So that's a, that's a principle of faith that we've been learning, that declaring what God says uh, not only over our lives, but over our finances also. That, that we don't keep saying uh, that, you know, I'm poor, I'm poor, I'm poor, right? Uh, well, the, the, the Word of God declares that though he was, you know, he was rich, he was made poor so that we could be made rich, right? In all ways, right? Um, so that's the, that's the reality of it all, that great exchange that happened on the cross. So what do I do? I don't declare. No. There could be some facts, right? That is that's another thing, right? The fact could be that bank is empty, bank account is empty. The fact could be that you know there is there is no provision for the next day. But those are the times when we continue to be faithful to declare God's promise. Those are the times, right? Well, when things are going fine, praise God. Right? We, we declare, we say, okay, God, you know, this is who you are, and I'm so glad and happy and joyful, and we celebrate all that. But what about times when times are difficult, when times are challenging, right? Those are the moments when we when continue to take the promise of God's word, continue to declare that, God, you are faithful, you have promised. Now, well, there could be certain things happening in our lives that take some time. There could be some hindrances, like we saw, you know, there could be hindrances. To a, you know, to God-given prosperity, yes, but we know that God is true. He is faithful. He is good, and He doesn't want. We know His heart. Right? He doesn't want to withhold. He doesn't want to keep us in a place of, you know, or put us in a prison of poverty. God wants to raise us up. Okay. So, what do we do in those moments? We take God's word and we declare, God, this is who You are. And this is who you want me to be. Okay, so we also saw uh, how we need to honor God in our finances. Right? Honoring God in our finances. That's the last thing we saw, right? Last class. Um, especially, you know, when it comes to giving. Okay. Honoring God. So it's not about, not only about receiving, right? Um, but also giving. So, where do we give? To whom do we give? Right? Giving to God is actually worshipping Him, acknowledging that He is our provider. Okay. So when we, you know, and typically when we, uh, you know, worship and when there's an offering and when we give, it is not that, you know, it's a ritualistic principle or practice that has been handed down or this is the way, you know, uh, churches function, so we need to do it. No, it's not that. It is a spiritual principle. And yes, it is something that is laid out in Scripture for us. But this is an act of declaring to God, Lord, I worship you. Right? So when you look at giving, we need to look at it that way. Right? Uh, giving to God, maybe an offering, and we look, need, need to look at it that way, that it is an act of worship. Okay, so when we think of worship, we think of songs. When we think of worship, we think of words spoken to God, right? When we think of worship, we also think of a life that is lived in a consecrated manner, a holy life, right? Uh, like it's uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, do not conform to this world, right? but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And before that, that you offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, which is a reasonable act of worship. Right? So you're giving yourself as a living sacrifice. So 
when we consecrate our lives to live in holiness, that is also an act of worship. So we think of all that as acts of worship. But what about giving? Okay, so let's look at that. Okay. So what are we saying when we, uh, when we give? We are actually saying, Lord, whatever you have given me, okay, through various means, Lord, I'm bringing to you and I'm acknowledging that you are my provider. Okay. So actually, you're giving part of your life. right? If you look at it, suppose you're a person who is working, who's earning. Like, How much time do you spend on, you know, maybe if in office or business or work, whatever, in your profession, how much time do you spend? Sorry? Eight to ten hours, right? Sometimes if you're starting off in a, you know, you know, in, a, in an organization and maybe probably more, you know, 12, 14 hours, right, uh, in a day. So the most part goes into that. And in return, you're get, getting a remuneration or salary or you know, at the end of the month. So it is literally your life. Whatever you pour, you're poured out, your life, you know, your seconds, minutes, hours you have spent and you're getting a remuneration and that salary actually represents whatever you poured in, whatever you poured out. Right? And you're actually taking that and you're saying, Lord, I worship you. A portion of it and you're saying, God, I worship you. So literally, you know, it's your life that you're giving and you're acknowledging, Lord, this is yours. You know, you think of it that way because it's it's time put in. It's part of your life which will never come back, right? So, you know, all those nine hours or ten hours or whatever, you know, every day that has been put in and into six days or, you know, 60 hours in a week. That's not going to come back, but you put in and you, you know, uh, being remunerated for that or getting a salary for that. And out of that, you're going and saying, Lord, I worship you. Okay. So there are several references on offerings and givings in the Word of God, right? Um, and we see in the Old Testament, it was a very solemn moment. It was also a joyful moment. It was a celebration, right? When people came and gave unto the Lord, right? It was a celebration, right? Um, so if you look at, uh, you know, First Chronicles chapter 16, right? It's there in the notes. Page 21, 22, chapter 16 says, Honor and majesty are before him, strength and gladness are in his place. Verse 28 Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Okay, so that we understand. Okay, give him glory, give him praise, right? Then it says, Bring an offering and come before him, O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness okay in the same same you know the, the same vein or in the same context is saying worship the lord in the beauty of holiness bring to the lord an offering and come before him right so we see that our money actually represents our our life right don't read too much into it i'm just when i say i represent my life you know every time we look at it it's my life you know we're not saying that saying that some something of your life you gave in order to receive that right so when you bring it back to god it's like bringing your life to him bringing your time and effort and everything to him and in worship right so next time you know when you whenever you're you know the time of offering there could be a teaching there may not be a teaching right but you personally do it as an act of worship. You tell the Lord, Lord, I thank you. I acknowledge that you are true to your word. I thank you for your provision. I thank you for your promises. And I'm worshiping you, God. You know, in doing this, I'm worshiping you. Right? Okay. Let's look at one more scripture reference. Um, First Chronicles 29, verses 10 to 14, and verse 16 also. Okay. Um, Therefore, David blessed the Lord before all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor 
come from you and you reign over all in your hand is power and might in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all now therefore oh god we thank you and praise you your glorious name right he's actually praising god david the psalmist the king and he says in verse 14 but who am i and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this for all things come from you and of your own we have given you so he's saying you know he's acknowledging the fact that god owns everything he owns everything because he created everything it's all his so he's saying of your own we have given you all this belongs to you god but of your own we have given you look at verse 16 O lord our god all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and is all your own. Right? So he's acknowledging and he's giving. Okay. Um, so the first thing that we see is that we worship the Lord. It's an act of worship when we give. Right? It, it, it also reflects our relationship with him, which is a covenant relationship. Right? So... We work, we, so when we give, we give out of that relationship. Right? We don't give it as a necessity. We don't give it or oh, something bad will happen. We don't give out of fear, but we give it joyfully and as uh, acknowledging that, God, you, we have a covenant with you. Right? Okay. Second one is also when we have a covenant relationship with people. Suppose we give to people. We're talking about now giving to people. right? So we see that, okay, God, you have blessed us. You know, Genesis 12, 2 talks about how... Um, let's maybe look at that scripture, right? Genesis 12 and verse 2, okay? Uh, where God promises Abraham and he says, you know, I will make, make you a great nation. I will bless you uh, and make your name great and you shall be a blessing, right? And you shall be a blessing. So... God, in blessing us, right, causes us, or really he's saying, you know, I'm blessing you so that you can be a blessing. That's what he did with Abraham. He, in his covenant with Abraham, Abraham, I'm blessing you so that you can be a blessing. So we are, of course, not in, we are in a better covenant, we are in a different dispensation, but God blesses us so that we can be a blessing, so we, we can be a channel of his blessing to others. When we say channel, we're saying it's like a just think of a think think of a hose or think of a you know something through which water can flow. God is saying, okay, I've blessed you so that you can actually bless others. You can be an instrument, you can be a channel of blessing, right? Uh, like a so that blessing can flow through you to others. Okay. Thirdly, we see that. Um, you know, this is a wonderful scripture. I think we should turn there. Second Corinthians nine. Second Corinthians nine six onwards, right? Okay, six to eight. Okay, this is what it says. But this I say: He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. It's in the context of giving. Again, right? And he says that um, he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Okay? So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves the cheerful giver. So, you know, so he's actually teaching the Corinthians and he's asking them to sow into the ministry. Right? He's also talking them, talking to them about to giving to the Macedonians, okay, who are actually uh, uh, during that time um, is something that they um, they were preparing to give as a financial blessing to the Macedonians, and that area was actually uh, you know they were uh, not too well off, and so he was uh, he had spoken prior to the Corinthian church, and they were actually preparing to give. And so he's reminding them. And in doing so, he's giving this particular teaching 
about giving, right? So he says, you know, he who sows, sows uh, sparingly will also reap sparingly. Now that's a natural law, right? The the more you, the more seeds that you spread, you know, agriculture, the more that you reap. So he's talking about that, and he's saying that let not each one give as he, uh, sorry, uh, let each one give as he purposes in his heart. So which means you decide. You decide between you, yourself, and God. Okay, you decide. Then what else? Not grudgingly. What does that mean, grudgingly? Sorry? With, uh, well, not, not anger. Like, uh, with, you hesitate. Right? You, you're hesitating, and you're giving, you know, okay, maybe this person is asking, so... And he's asked me publicly, and how can I refuse? You know, it's not with the whole heart. Sorry? Yeah. So, not grudgingly. He's saying, hey, don't even, don't even think like that. No, this is something that we planned a year ago. I'm just reminding you about it. But if you're giving, you give as you purpose in your heart. I'm not even saying that, okay, each person should give this much. Right? He's saying... You purpose, you decide in your heart, and then you give. Not grudgingly, okay? Not or of necessity, meaning, oh, I, I need to do this, I'm required to do this, um, so let me do this, right? So there also, you know, you're like, you're not wholeheartedly giving. It says here, for God loves a cheerful giver. So which means you purpose in your heart, and you give cheerfully. Yeah, when you're giving, you give cheerfully. So that's the requirement. And it says, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that always having all that you have always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. So this is this is a principle. So he's saying, you know, this is sowing, there's time, and then there's reaping. Sowing time reaping you know so he's saying that this is how it is this is this is what it is in god's eyes when you give it is like sowing it is like sowing when you sow into a land when you sow that seed there it will take some time it will grow there will be a harvest in a sim in a similar way he's saying you know you do it cheerfully right don't do it grudgingly don't do out of necessity because god loves a cheerful giver that's god's desire but he's saying, you know, when you sow, this is how it is in the natural. So also with God. You know, God is able to make all grace abound towards you, verse 8, that you, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Okay. So he's saying this is the principle, right? When you give. No, there is the sowing and reaping. So God takes pleasure. So God is saying, you know, you sow generously and you also reap out of it, okay, generously. Okay, so we, we, we see all this um, when we, uh, you know, when we learn about this. So um, the way to give, okay, give wholeheartedly, okay. Uh, well, it is hard on our flesh, yes or no. Sometimes we have questions, sometimes we have doubts. And it's hard on our flesh. It's like, oh, should I really give this? Right? So die to the self, die to the flesh, and give. Give the first and the best. Right? That is what we see in scripture. Right? Give the first and the best. Thirdly, give in recognition of the law, law of sowing and reaping. You know, give that God will make all grace abound. And you will have an abundance for every good work. And give with a heart of love. Okay? So some practical things that we see here. So what are the three areas of giving, in a sense? You know, to whom do I give? Right. First of all, okay, uh, yeah, this, if you're following in the notes, it's page 23, right? Three areas of giving. The first area is that you know, God has instituted a principle of tithing, okay, one-tenth of all our income to give as an act of worship to God. Okay, so tithing. So, which means that wherever you are placed, you know, where you are, what should I say, you know, wherever you are, 
are rooted, you know, maybe a church, maybe, uh, you know, fellowship, ministry, whatever, wherever you are placed there, wherever you are spiritually nurtured and wherever you are serving also. Right? So there's no hard and fast. In the Old Testament, it was to the temple. It's one place, it's like one, one granary, so everybody gave there. But right now, you can give wherever you are placed, you are rooted in. Right? So you tithe. Tithe is one-tenth, right? which is 10% of all our income, whatever we get, you give as an act of worship to God. Right? Give to the place where you are spiritually fed. You know, that's just a practical thing. You know, you place, you feel that, okay, this is where I'm spiritually fed, this is where I am, this is where I'm fellowshipping, this is where I'm serving. Okay, give. Okay. Then the second one is an offering. Okay, so the offering we see is beyond the tithe. Okay. This is something which is beyond the tithe. And um, it is again freely given and is a free will. So that's over and above the tithes. You know, in, in say here when we see uh, Second Corinthians chapter nine, the the portion that we read just now, you know, it, it is talking about you know an offering. Okay. Then the third one is an is what we call as arms or ALM. Okay, arms. So it is something that we give to help someone who is needy some someone who is in a place of need okay um, it, it need not be always someone who is stricken with poverty or you know uh, it can be anyone who has a need financially um, and um, you know so that's the thing you're giving right um, so it could be the poor and the helpless it could be you know so this is also in addition to our tithes and offerings okay so when it comes to tithes we see this principle, right, it goes way back, right? In, in Genesis 14, we, we see that. And um, maybe we'll just read that, right? Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20. Okay. Okay. So Genesis 14, verse 20 talks about Melchizedek. Uh, maybe we'll read, read from verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High. And he blessed him. He blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of God, Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God, Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And he gave him a tithe of all. Okay, So, um, so Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. All. So that's the first thing, first time that we read about the tithe, a one tenth, right, and uh, and so on. So we see that Isaac also uh, tithes because Abraham obviously uh, taught him. So Isaac also tithes, and, and we read about that, right. So the it is what is it? Is the first fruit of your increase? Proverbs three nine says the first fruits of your increase, okay. or you know, in other words, in modern terms, we could say it's the you know, whatever income, whatever increase that we have received, a tenth of that. Okay. Now, there are some reasons why people do not tithe. Okay. There could be some reasons. Let's look at that. First of all, it could be lack of knowledge. Okay. So, I, I, in my mind, it could be like, okay, what is tithing? I was not even taught. I didn't know about finances, I didn't know that one had to type. Okay, so maybe a new believer, or it could be, you know, maybe a not necessarily a new believer, someone who's there in faith for so many years, but maybe they were not exposed to this, right? Or this teaching, or they didn't know. So this is it. Lack of knowledge. Secondly, it could be fear. Okay. Why do you want why do you why don't you want to type? You know, what if God does not perform or what God does not fulfill what he has promised, right? Second Corinthians 9 verse 8 says, okay, that he will make all things abound, that I will have abundance, all sufficiency and abundance for good work. But what if that does not happen? For whatever reason, if that doesn't happen, then right, I've given and my money is gone and it could be fear. Thirdly, it could be selfishness. You know, just saying that, okay, this is mine. That is yours. <laughs> I want to keep mine 
for myself right fourthly deception you know it could be deception and and some of it is you know it's it's a i would say it is it's sad but it happens right happens in christianity happens in in you know the churches that we see that okay here are these people preachers people in ministry and they are exploiting me they want my money okay they want my money to feed themselves they want my money they want to use it for they want to increase and and the fact is that it is it is sadly true right there is an abuse of finances in the church that we see right? abuse no accountability right no one knows how much is going no one know, no one knows what are the expenses no one knows how much is being taken and used right there is no there's no line between personal money and church money sir sometimes it happens there's an abuse of it so people fear that and saying okay i don't want to give or maybe they have given like i you know recently met someone who had actually given quite a bit to a particular church that he was part of uh, for the building building project and so on and then he came to know that uh, well there was misappropriation of the funds right the people used it uh, not just for the building thing but maybe for the whatever in whatever way they misappropriate so he was very very upset when he saying i i don't want to give i don't want to give to this church i don't want to give and he upset to the point of saying i don't want to come to church i do not want to come to church. if this is what church is about i do not want to be there right so for him church, church is just a social gathering he, he said it in so many ways i go there to meet my relatives i go there to say hello to them not to receive anything from you know no spiritual input nothing you know it's, it's unfortunate right okay so it could be that could be a reality why people don't type or it could also be some religious or religious lies if you want to call it that or it could be misapplication of truth right uh, misapplication of scripture wrong understanding of scripture for example you know we could say tithing is part of the old testament where does it say in the new testament you don't see that word we don't see that principle in operation okay so the abraham tithe it's part of the old testament law okay but actually if you look at it it was not part of the old testament law okay so you may ask then what do you mean thing is tithing as a principle when we see in genesis 14 the law was had not yet been given right the law came much later in fact it came 400 years after after that conversation um sorry where is this yeah it, it came almost 400 years after um abraham tithed so which means he tithed out of a covenant relationship with god not because the law says you shall tithe unto your god so and so you know you understand right it's not part of the old testament law it was much before that and also isaac says here that 350 years before moses before the law was given he had tithe so abraham and isaac tithe even before the law so it was not you know it's not that they you know it's it's part of the old testament law and therefore since we do not follow the old testament law now we do not have to tithe no this was done even before right second one people say okay tithing okay let's say it was part of the old testament old dispensation it ended at the cross now we are in the new dispensation right a lot of things finished got over done at the cross and so now we are on this side of the cross therefore we do not have to tithe okay so that could be um, you know a, a, an argument right so we see that okay for every instance of something that is discontinued or changed right there are specific new testament verses scriptures identifying the change and talking about it so for example the blood sacrifice okay it was there as part of the old testament law people came people sacrificed animals birds burnt offerings everything as part of the worship to god right so did it continue 
why is it not continuing sorry yeah yeah so jesus was that ultimate sacrifice that perfect sacrifice so all these animal sacrifices or everything that was a blood sacrifice was pointing to jesus right it was a symbol or a type of what would follow that is the lord's perfect sacrifice on the cross so you know hebrews talks about that that you know that this is the perfect sacrifice hebrews 10 so he was that uh, you know let's read that verse no hebrews 9 11 hebrews 10 uh, 12 okay let's turn to hebrews chapter 9 but christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation verse 12 not with the blood of goats and calves but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once and for all having obtained eternal redemption let's keep reading for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living god okay so he was that perfect sacrifice chapter 10 verse 12 but this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down at the right hand of God. It was 14. By, for by one offering, he has perfected those who are being sanctified. For by one sacrifice, one offering, he has perfected those who are being sanctified. So we see that he's a perfect sacrifice. So there is no more requirement. No other requirement required. He's a perfect sacrifice. Because everything, all that was done was actually in preparation, helping people to understand that there will be this perfect sacrifice. And once that perfect sacrifice was done, there was no other requirement. Jesus need not go on to the cross again because it was already, it's a finished uh, work, right? So the blood sacrifice discontinued. Okay, what about access to the Father? Which means, you know, who can go to God? Because it was only the high priest, right? It was only the high priest who could go. That to uh, once a year, he could go to the holy place, and after doing, you know, after uh, sprinkling the blood, and you know, he, I mean, uh, sorry, after the sacrifice uh, uh, at the altar, the brazen altar, and then he goes in, and then uh, I'm talking about the tabernacle, right? He goes in and then sprinkles the blood, uh, uh, the most holy place, and you know, the showbread and incense is there, and all that he does. But he goes there. Into the most holy place once, right? Once a year. And that's it. He does that on behalf of the people. Right? On behalf of the people. Not everybody has access. Okay. But now we know when Jesus died on the cross, something happened at the temple, right? You remember, right? Something happened in the temple. What happened? That veil, which was like yes. a curtain, right? From top to bottom, it was torn, split into symbolically, symbolically, you know, representing or stating that now there is no more barrier. Now all of us, because this was one perfect sacrifice, one blood, uh, you know, offering. So all of us who appropriate are able to go through that perfect, I mean, the holy place and. And there is no more barrier for us because this has created a way. And that's why, you know, Hebrews again talks about the fact that he has made a way for us to come to the Holy of Holies, right? So he's by a living way, he has made for us to come to the Holy of Holies. So, which means that all of us, we can have access all the time to the Father, okay? Right, look at uh, Hebrews um, chapter 4. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to where? 
to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, so we see that all of us, each one of us, have that access and um, to come to the throne room of grace. Um, I just want to read from Hebrews 10, verse 19 onwards. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Okay. Um, Uh, okay, we have a question from Andrew. Andrew, I'll just come to that when we after we finish this. Okay, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Okay, so in the book of Hebrews, he talks about the, the Old Testament sacrifices and he talks about the new and living way which Jesus made for us. So he's saying, you know, this is it. The, through the veil, he has actually created a way for us. And so let us draw near with, with a true heart and um, in full assurance of faith and with repentance and so on. Okay. So, so what we see is that we, all of us have access to the Father. So we see stated in the New Testament very categorically that, yes, this is what it is. We can draw near. All of us as believers can draw near. And therefore, the just the high priest drawing near is, it, bring, it, it is brought to an end at the cross. So, okay. Okay, Andrew's question is, uh, the accountancy of offering should be maintained transparent with the church. My question is, even the tithes, we need to maintain transparency with the church. Okay. So, so the thing is this, you know, uh, it's between us and God, like we saw, you know, let each one give as he purposes in his heart. So on, on the part of the church, now they can maintain, they need to maintain transparency saying, okay, so much was received like from the congregation. So much was received from the congregation. But from our part, right, we give as we purpose in our hearts. So we don't have to publish, we don't have to announce say, I'm giving so much, we don't have to do that. Now, I know that certain, uh, you know, certain uh, places, you, you write, you know, uh, the tithes, the, in a cover, you write the amount, and that's for the purpose of, you know, people receiving and, and uh, accounting for it and so on, and saying that, okay, this is, this is, goes towards the tithes. So some people might have a thing, okay, this goes, uh, goes under a category of tithes. This goes under the hat category of offering. This goes under the category of, you know, maybe it's used for outreach. Similarly, so you write on the cover what is what is it as a person who's giving. So that's 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 all it is, right? To it. Um, so I know some some people at some churches I've heard maintain. Okay, they have a register, your name, and uh, every month, what is it? What is the type? You know, one month you miss, and it's like brother, sister, what happened? Type didn't come. You know, so you know. We don't, it's not a healthy practice, right? So us maintaining transparency is between us and God, and we give as we purpose in our hearts, like we read. Um, so, yeah, so did that help, Andrew? You know, as a pastor, we need to give account. Yeah, as pastors, we need to give account to the extent that so much of money has come in, you know, both um, legally as a as an account to uh, you know in terms of auditing and uh, legally there's a, there's a requirement you know it, it differs in different uh, nations different places I don't know how how it is in your country but you know legally if you're registered as a trust well you have certain as a religious trust you have certain exemptions to income tax and therefore you need to present you need to file your return saying this is, um, have it audited and have it, um, you know, presented, have it filed, saying this is this is the money, this has come in. So that's, that's a legal requirement, yeah. So, and also, it's good to keep it transparent with the congregation saying, this Sunday we receive this, and uh, and so on. I hope that helps, Andrew. Okay. Okay, we'll stop here. That's all time we have now, and we'll continue next class. Okay, thank you. God bless.